negotiators of the TRIPS agreement did, they came with these two provisos. The one provisor is, proviso is that if you're going to protect a well-known mark uh, for certain goods and services in different classes, then there should be, the use of that trademark should indicate a connection in the course of trade with the owner of the well-known mark and second proviso that there can be the risk of damage to his interests. That was the TRIPS agreement and the Paris Convention. You would argue, well, that was good enough for well-known monarchs. Well, apparently not. Apparently, the TRIPS that was supposed to solve many situations created additional questions for the public. And this part was not even in the preparatory work of the TRIPS agreement defined. Um, and the group of experts that was meeting at WIPO uh, almost at the same time that the TRIPS uh, negotiation was taking place uh, in the WTO, or is now the WTO at the time of the GATT, um, came up with a set of provisions that is called the Joint Recommendation on Weather and Marks. This was adopted in 1999 and it's called joint recommendation because it was recommended by two bodies of WIPO, the uh, Paris Union Assembly and the WIPO General Assembly. So the top two bodies for industrial property at WIPO. Um, and they tried to come up uh, with a set of provisions. I'm not going to mention all the articles, the six provisions, uh, which are assorted with explanatory notes. I'm just going to refer to what can be considered probably the milestones of these provisions, the determination of well-known uh, um, re relevant sector of the public, and uh, how can a trademark be determined to be well-known. Um, some of these have been incorporated in your laws, so probably this is not unknown to you, duration, extent, and geographical area of any use of the mark duration, extent, and geographical area of any promotion of the mark, duration and geographical area of any registrations, not only registrations, but also applications for registration, the successful record of enforcement of the trademark, and the value associated with the mark. Although the joint recommendation in the body of the recommendation, nor in the notes, does not provide for any specific method of trademark valuation, neither does it recommend it. Um, the relevant sector of the public here um, was clarified and uh, said to refer to actual or potential customers for the type of goods and services persons involved in the relevant channels of trade, the business circles dealing with the relevant goods and services, um, and to my liking, the real innovation of the joint recommendation is Article 4, because it did what the TRIPS Agreement 16.3 did not do, which is refer to dilution and refer to free writing. Although Article 4 of the joint recommendation doesn't call those two by their, by their names, um, this is very much the spirit. As you can see, um, number one that I put here is 16.3, meaning protection for dissimilar goods and services provided there is a connection with the owner and likelihood of damage to his interests. But then the joint recommendation goes on and then, and then it says the use of the mark is likely to impair or dilute in an unfair manner the distinctive character of the well-known mark. And this type of language we don't find in the TRIPS agreement. So this is really the plus of the joint recommendation. Um, the use of that mark would take unfair advantage of the distinctive character of the well-known mark. This is language also that one can find in uh, the European directive that um, is supposed to harmonize the laws of the 27 members of the European community. Um, one thing that we obviously know is that the well-known well -known character of a trademark is determined mostly, most of the time, in opposition procedures or in validation, cancellation procedures, and these are actions available to trademark holders around the world. Uh, prohibition of use, 
uh, of course, we know that in that um, actual jurisdictions. Now, um, for most part of the negotiation of the TRIPS agreement, um, people have trouble with dilution because dilution is basically an Anglo-Saxon institution. It's not, it was not uh, at the time any part of European law. And as I told you in my introduction, um, I'm probably going to talk a, a lot about trademark law because that's uh, about European trademark law because that's closer to me. After this conference, I hope that I will learn a lot more about law in this part of the world. Um, dilution is um, an institution that started in Germany, but funnily enough, made it uh, trip across the ocean to, to the U.S., where, where this, it, it has really developed. Um, this judge, Franz Hefter, you probably heard of it before, um, came up with this idea that well-known marks should be protected irrespective of um, the types of goods and services. And we're talking 1925 uh, when he came up with that, and then in 1927 he wrote this article for the Hard Art Law Review. And um, I guess because of the product, because he was referring to um, a mouthwash, um, he was of course talking about the effect of dilution, just, just like a mouthwash dissolves in water, and that's what he thought uh, would happen to a trademark that is used even on dissimilar goods and services. So the case here in Germany uh, was that somebody tried to use the mark Odo for something completely different, for steel railroad products, had nothing to do with the line of products that the mark Odo uh, was on. Um, so when you have six bits, you have a risk of confusion. And of course, confusion relates to identical or similar goods and services. When you move to dilution, uh, you have a risk of association, and there you can have dissimilar goods and services. In the European community, uh, there are two main bodies of legislation that have recognized these institutions. Uh, the first one is the directive that I told you, that one is supposed to harmonize the law of the 27 members of the European community. And the second one is the council regulation uh, that regulates the functioning of the CTM, the European Community Trademark, which is a unitary right uh, valuable in all the 27 member countries. In Europe, there are two kinds of dilution. There is dilution by blurring, um, so that's a detriment to the distinctiveness of the mark. They also recognize the dilution by tarnishing, uh, which is detri detrimental. Um, to your left, and the one of Puma was the one to the right. Um, and here, um, the judge was really not sure, the court, because it went to the former European Court of Justice, now European Court. Um, did the court consider that the mere association so we are talking about the risk of association and not the risk of confusion, but at the time, things were not very clear. The mere association was not in itself sufficient ground to indicate confusion. So the judge was not clear about these two concepts. And they, um, the judge applied um, one article of the directive, and he said um, that the likelihood of association is not an alternative to the likelihood of confusion. And also, um, 
this mark, the, the puma, uh, was a less known mark. So he thought that although the marks were conceptually similar, meaning a cat and a cat, or a puma and, and some kind of feline animal in any case, that was not sufficient um, to raise um, the, the risk of confusion. So they took, they took a global approach and they thought that this was not a candidate uh, for confusion. In a further case, we're talking already 1999, um, the judges were looking at the degree of knowledge. They, they went on a different thing. So they were not analyzing the signs themselves. They were analyzing the degree of knowledge of the earlier mark. Um, and they thought um, that the, the degree of knowledge um, was not sufficient. Um, so they said, when deciding whether uh, a degree of knowledge is sufficient, certain factors should be taken into account. And there you see a clear influence of the job recommendation on well-known marks were already in 1999, so you can recognize language of the WIPO job recommendation on well-known marks. The market share of the earlier mark, the level of use, is pretty much the factors uh, of the 1999 joint recommendation, the geographic scope. Um, so by then, the judges were beginning to accept uh, new ideas. And uh, also in 1999, in yet another case, you can see Canon and this other one that was misspelled on purpose uh, to make it different. Um, then the judge considered that the distinctiveness of the earlier mark, and in particular, its reputation, must be taken into account when determining whether the nationality, uh, sorry, the similarity between the goods and services is sufficient to eliminate the risk of confusion. But still, the judges are very much gambling with these two concepts, with association and confusion. And of course, they are looking for an inter dependence between the factors and also the similarity or the dissimilarity of the signs. Already in 2004, when this case came, uh, the, the, the three strikes case, um, the uh, court had to evaluate if without any risk of confusion, there was something in this mark. Um, that could provide for a link. And then they said, the relevant sector of the public establishes a link between the sign and the mark, even if they are not confusing the trade source, but there is a link. And this link was given by the three stripes. So the defendant argued that the three stripes were only an embellishment that this was only a decorative element of the mark. And uh, for this case, 